today on Grace to You. It is a parable that has to do with money. What am I going to do to secure my future? Invest in what proclaims the gospel and brings people to salvation. It's not about how much you have, it's about who you are. It's about what your priorities are. It's about whether heaven is where your heart is, right? What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Let me encourage you to come to Luke 16. It is a parable that has to do with money. And that's not odd because about one out of three parables will have something to do with money. So let's get the story in mind, starting in verse 1, Luke 16. He was also saying to the disciples, hey, now I want you to know this is for us. This is for us as it was for His disciples. That is not to say that there weren't others listening. Down in verse 14, the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things, and of course they were scoffing at them. This is what we would expect from the people who didn't understand this parable and who in many ways were defined by this parable because they were lovers of money. So they're in the crowd listening, but the direction of this parable, as always, is to hide the truth from them because of their resolute unbelief and to give the lesson to His disciples and to us. There was a rich man who had a manager, steward, and this manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And he called him and said to him, "'What is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management, for you can no longer be manager.' The manager said to himself, "'What shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig, I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do so that when I am removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors, and he began saying to the first, this is a process he goes through, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write eighty. And his master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light." That's the story. Keep in mind, there's nothing in this parable that's secret or hidden or allegorical or mystical. It's a simple story. But what bothers some people is Jesus commends the bad guy. In verse 8, listen to his closing. His master praised the unrighteous manager because he acted shrewdly. And then in verse 9, Jesus says, and I say, make friends for yourselves by the means of the wealth of unrighteousness. Wow. Do what he did? It is a problem for some people to... uh, to have Jesus saying, follow the behavior of a wasteful, profligate, prodigal, deceitful, thieving, selfish, conniving, unprincipled person. And by the way, uh, this is placed here right after the story of the prodigal son because this is a prodigal manager. Prodigal means wasteful. The son wasted everything and didn't provide for his future. Here's a man who wasted the assets that he had control of but did provide for his futures. This was pretty common in ancient times where uh, people who were very wealthy had a lot of operations going on, a lot of agricultural operations going on, businesses going on, and they hired managers. The term manager, oikonomos, uh, from the Greek which means law or uh, and, and house, he had the law of the house. He was the one delegated the authority to act for the owner. He managed the land, he managed the crops, he managed the assets, he managed the debts. 
Uh, he managed the internally the dispersing of, uh, of the resources and, and the food and whatever was necessary by the ser- for, for the servants and all the people who made up the core who uh, operated this particular enterprise. So he had inside responsibility, also had outside responsibility. Very important guy. He has proxy to act on behalf of this very wealthy owner. He's the administrator of the state on the inside of the estate on the inside and on the outside, a position of high responsibility, uh, a position of social status because he would be interacting with very important people, maybe even other landowners on behalf of his master. Well, this manager has been wasting his owner's substance, his possessions. So he calls him, says, what is this I hear about you? And then he does a foolish thing, this character that Jesus invents because it suits him, suits the story. Give an accounting of your management, for you can no longer be manager. Unlike any smart businessman, he says essentially, go back and get an accounting of what you've done. Go, I want you to go back and I want you to account for what you've done. So in verse 3, he says to himself, a little soliloquy here, what shall I do? so that when I am removed from the management, when it actually happens and I'm terminated, people will welcome me into their homes. I, I've got to find a way to, to go somewhere else. I've got to have a place to live. I've got to have an income. Uh, I've got to have a future. What am I going to do to secure my future when my master takes away my stewardship, my management? I know what I will do. This is his eureka moment. This is his bright idea. I need to be welcomed by some people into their homes. Who are those people going to be when, when, when the whole community knows that I've been thrown out for my mismanagement? Ah, I know who it'll be. It'll be the people that I've been working with who owe my master debts. So I have a plan. I'm going to contact all the people who owe my master debts, and I'm going to go through them all one by one by one by one by one, and I'm going to discount all their debts. Pretty shrewd. I'm going to discount all their debts so that they will be obligated to me, right? Now, if he only did this for one guy? There wouldn't be any peer pressure on the one guy to reciprocate. But if he does it for everybody in an honor society where everybody's concerned about his honor, they're all going to put peer pressure on everybody else, and he's not only going to have one home to go to, he's going to have a whole lot of homes to go to because they will want to maintain their honor. Well, Jesus' comment on this is pretty amazing. Verse 8, the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light." What? Jesus is commending the guy? This is what has uh, troubled some people. Why? What we would, we would understand the manager, I mean the owner commending the manager, that's, you know, he's applauding his shrewdness, we get that. But, but what is, why is Jesus commending this? He acted shrewdly. Let's just make sure we get that. Phronimos is the word. It means providently, uh, uh, considerably. It was a it was well devised scheme. He took careful advantage of an opportunity. He worked the situation to secure his future benefit, his future comfort. By reducing the debts, he indebted everybody to him. What did this guy do? What did this manager do? He used what he had, his assets the wealth of unrighteousness, to purchase dwellings for His future, temporal future. That's what the, that's what the perverted, uh, wicked sons of this age have always done and always do. You, He says, you need to be at least as shrewd as they are. And by the way, this is an old rabbinic approach, reasoning from the lesser to the greater. Use your money, your possessions, your wealth, even though it's part of the unrighteous system in the old English, the mammon of unrighteousness, kind of an ominous term. 
Unrighteous wealth is part of the passing world, and He even says it, it will fail. And when it fails, as stated in verse 9, so take money, wealth, which will fail, you can't take it with you, we all understand that, and use that unrighteous wealth, that wealth that has in itself no virtue, no righteousness, and purchase friends with it who will receive you into the eternal dwellings. Buy friends for heaven who will be standing at the gate welcoming you when you arrive. But that's what the sons of this age do with the wealth of unrighteousness. They try to secure their temporal future, and it it can do that. It, It can secure a temporal future until they die, until they die, and then it fails and it will fail. You cannot take it with you. It belongs to this temporal world. It is, again, the wealth of unrighteousness. It doesn't go anywhere. And yet, in a most amazing and gracious and merciful manner, the Lord says, you can take that wealth that isn't going with you, and while you're here, you can make friends that will welcome you into heaven. How do you do that? It's pretty simple. You invest in kingdom enterprises that bring about the salvation of sinners. That's what you do. You use your money to purchase friends for eternity. This is exactly what our Lord was talking about in Matthew chapter 6. In the familiar statements in the Sermon on the Mount, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Anybody understand? have a problem understanding that? But the question is, how can I put my treasure in heaven? How can I put my treasure in heaven? How can I take the wealth of unrighteousness and, and put it in heaven and purchase friends that will welcome me when I arrive? Answer, invest in what proclaims the gospel and brings people to salvation. Invest in the kingdom enterprises. That's what you do with your money, with your wealth, so that you'll have a welcome when you get there. What an amazing, amazing thought, isn't it? How good is God? Look, um, um, life's pretty short for me, you know. Eternity's eternity. This thing is flown by in a blink in this world. And the the longer I live, the less meaning anything has that is to be left here. And the more meaning everything has that purchases friends for eternity. You invest in those who preach the gospel, those who teach people to preach the gospel. You invest in missionaries and those who send missionaries. You, You invest in every gospel enterprise that multiplies teachers and preachers and evangelists and the spread of the Word and the spread of the truth around the world, and you are purchasing friends for eternity. Endless personal accumulation is meaningless. Whatever your little treasures are, they're staying here, and somebody else is going to figure out what to do with them. But there is one thing you can send up. Isn't that amazing? It is your wealth. If it's invested in the proclamation of the gospel and in the preparation training of those who proclaim the gospel. And what an, what an amazing thing to be a part of something like this, where we're all doing this, and what we could never do individually, we can do beyond our wildest imagination collectively. So you say, well, I don't give much, but I don't have much. If I had more, I'd give more. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Now, if you had more, you wouldn't give any more. Say, how do you know that? You don't know me. Well, Jesus does. Verse 10. (laughs) He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. I told you. It's not about how much you have, it's about who you are. It's about what your priorities are. It's about whether heaven is where your heart is, right? 
That's what it's about. This is, a, this is what we call an axiom or an axiomatic statement, a truism. It's self-evident. It's so self-evident that it doesn't have an explanation. It doesn't have a defense. It is obvious that faithful people are faithful people whether they have little or much, and unfaithful people are unfaithful whether they have little or much. It's never a question of how much you have. If you are concerned about the advance of the kingdom and you are committed to making friends for eternity, you will give what you have generously and joyfully. The amount you possess is not the issue. Your character is the issue. Your commitment is the issue. Your love for heaven is the issue. You're either unselfish, humble, generous, non-materialistic, committed to the kingdom with all your heart, or you're not, and it's not a question of an amount. No, it has nothing to do with an amount. And uh, Jesus isn't finished with us. He says in verse 11, so let's say you haven't been faithful. You're, you're one of those who has been self-indulgent, accumulating, and spending all your money on things you're going to leave here. If you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, talking to sons of light, believers, disciples, who will entrust the true to you, literally the true to you, the true things to you? If you have not been faithful in the unrighteous, who, meaning God, is going to give you things that are spiritual and eternal. So what happens is, as you demonstrate unfaithfulness in the use of your unrighteous wealth, you forfeit spiritual and eternal blessings, both now and forever. You may buy yourself endless stuff. Creature comforts, all the shallow things, all the corrupting things, all the temporary things, all stuff that burns up, but you will not receive the real riches, the things that will last forever. Do you remember Luke 6.38, given it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over? You can't outgive God so sparingly. Paul says to the Corinthians, reap sparingly, so bountifully, what? Reap bountifully. You can't outgive God. And there's another sting about to come in verse 12, and if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? What do you mean, the use of what is another's? Well, he's been saying, talking about the wealth of unrighteousness. The use of unrighteous wealth in verse 11 corresponds to the use of that which is another's. Guess what? The wealth you have isn't yours. Like that steward, right? He was profligate with somebody else's resources. Say, wait a minute. What I have is mine. I earned it. I worked hard for it. Well, that may be true. You worked hard for it, but it's not yours. The sons of this age live in indulgence, exploitation, selfishness, hoarding, conspicuous consumption, waste, etc., and think that it's all theirs. We know better. Prophet Haggai says, the silver is mine, speaking for God, the gold is mine, it's all mine. Psalm 104, 24, the earth is full of your possessions. Do you remember, I'm sure you... You do if you've been around the Word of God very long. Do you remember David's blessing in First Chronicles 29? So David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are You, O Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, Yours is the dominion, O Lord, and You exalt Yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from You. You rule over all. In Your hand is power and might, and it lies in Your hand to make great and to strengthen every 
everyone. Now, therefore, our God, we thank You, praise Your glorious name." It's all Yours. The psalmist says, "'The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof.'" It's all His. You fail the test of stewardship, you lose significance in the kingdom, and you lose eternal blessing, eternal reward. You waste your money on things that are going to perish. You waste God's money on things that are going to perish, accumulate things for yourself, and you're just inversely cutting into your spiritual blessings and eternal reward. And again, eternity is a very long time, very long time. You might come to the conclusion that you could do without a whole lot for a few years. If, if you could have a vast eternal reward that would expand your joys everlastingly and allow you to worship Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit with a capacity that would be massive. What, what is eternal reward? It is a capacity to worship. Well, he's not done. He boils it down to one statement in verse 13. No slave can serve two masters. You can't be bought and owned and obligated to two masters. You could work for two bosses. You could have two jobs. Some of you have ten bosses. In fact, everybody around is your boss. Um, that's not what it's saying. It's saying you, in a slave world, you can't, you can only be owned by one person. You have to decide. There are two possible owners that you can have. You can um, have God or you can have wealth. And you can, if you do that, if you try to have two masters as a slave and you try to serve God and wealth, then you're going to hate one and love the other or you're going to be devoted to one and despise the other. That, that is a very clear point to anybody in ancient times, fitting analogy. God wants single-minded, focused loyalty and fidelity and faithfulness to Him. And it isn't as if somehow it's a punishment that's offered here if we don't do that. It's a forfeiture of blessing and a forfeiture of reward. It isn't negative consequences that motivate us in this. It's positive ones. A conflicting demand. I mean, if you're caught between money and God, uh, you're a conflicted person. You're, you're experiencing antagonism. You're, some of you are feeling antagonistic right now with me talking to you. That's what happens in your life, is this, this conflict goes on. I'm not saying you can't richly enjoy the things that the Lord has provided for you, but I'm saying you cannot be a slave to God and a slave to money. Being a slave to money is, is really a very serious condition. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul, 1 Timothy 6, "'We brought nothing into the world, so we can't take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction.'" Wow. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of what? Evil. It's not money that's the root of evil. It's the love of it, and you can have a whole lot of it and not love it, and you can have none of it and love it like crazy. Some people who have loved their money and been slaves to their wealth have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You can't love God with a whole heart and love wealth with a whole heart. The language is very strong and very clear. John Calvin said, where riches hold the dominion of the heart, God has lost His authority. Covetousness makes us the slaves of the devil. One of the writers who affected me a lot when I was young in ministry and, and doing some reading to try to orient my theology was Arthur Pink. and. Pink writes this, and I think it's worth reading. He says, uh, these orders are diametrically opposed. The one commands you to walk by faith, the other to walk by sight. 
the one to be humble, the other to be proud, the one to set your affections on things above, the other to set them on the things that are on the earth, the one to look at the things unseen and eternal, the other to look at the things seen and temporal, the one to have your conversation in heaven, the other to cleave to the dust. The one to be careful for nothing, the other to be full of anxiety. The one to be content with such things as you have, the other to enlarge your desires. The one to be ready to distribute, the other to withhold. The one to look at the things of others, the other to look at one's own things. The one to seek happiness in the Creator, the other to see happiness in the creature. Is it not plain there is no serving two such masters? So, the possession of wealth is a means God has employed for you to secure eternal reward and heavenly friends. Pretty good offer? You're going to be there forever. Your capacity to worship, praise, and enjoy God and eternal glory is bound up in what you do with the the wealth of unrighteousness. The world's people, hey, they're acting shrewdly, conniving to secure their temporal future, and they have none beyond that. What are you doing to secure your eternal future? You know these words, words by M. E. Byrne, riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance, now and always, Thou and Thou only, first in my heart, high King of heaven, my treasure Thou art." A long time ago, 1969, I uh, came as pastor of Grace Community Church, and within a few months people said, you know, we need to be taping the messages. Uh, reel-to-reel tape. There weren't even cassettes then. Uh, Within a few years, cassettes came, and a few more years, CDs came. And In the process of all that development, we went on the radio because people said, this needs to be on the radio. And then eventually, we we ended up on TV because people said, this needs to be on television. And and pretty soon, uh, it it was all web-based technology and downloads and uh, All through these years, books were being developed and special series were being developed and we started writing daily blogs to educate people in the Word of God. You know, when I look at all of this, I didn't plan this, I I didn't drive this, I didn't design this. The Lord has just pulled us in all these directions. And for what? To make the teaching of the Word of God available by any and every means possible all over the world. Books translated into 40 different languages, study Bibles in 10 languages, commentaries in multiple languages. Everything we do is printed almost simultaneously in India. There's just no end to the reach. The mission's always been simple. Preach the Word and see what the Lord will do with it. And I've always kind of based that on a simple principle. If I take care of the depth of the ministry, God will take care of the breadth of it. If the depth honors Him, He'll expand that. And we've seen that in Grace to Use history.